welcome to The Photography Guy. I'm your host, The Photography Guy. Let's get started here with another great photo show. Hey, yes, welcome back, everybody. Once again, it looks like everything's going on here pretty well. I'm going to flick a couple cameras here. No, I guess that's okay. All right. Um, yep. Looks pretty good there. All right. We're going to get started here this morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back once again to The Photography Guy. This is episode number 74 for Sunday, December the 19th. 2015. I'm your host, Jack. Thanks for joining me here once again to learn more about your camera and making great photographs. Please, if you get time, check out my website at thephotographyguy.net where you can comment on these shows. If you are listening to the audio podcast, please also check out the YouTube channel at 42 Technoman. Once again, that's number 42 Technoman. Please visit my learning site at www.jtclearning.com where you'll find hours of photography training at a price that can't be beat by anybody else on the internet. And I've seen a lot of crazy prices out there. So check those out at jtclearning.com. If you get a chance, I want to just do it all. Whoa. <laughs> If you get a chance, please check out our Facebook group. You can join the Facebook group at Jack's Tech Corner. I was just looking this morning. I mean, there's a lot of fantastic uh, folks in there. And, um, you know, we share our work. We, we look at other people's work. And you know, we don't criticize anything. We, we don't get to that point where we're like, oh, your, your photographs are terrible. No, we just want to see what you're doing out there. And, you know, how you're playing around with your photographs and maybe give us some ideas. And it always um, <clears throat> gives me great ideas for the show. So, that's a wonderful thing to do. So I really appreciate uh, you joining the group. And it, it's just a very, very nice community. So I'm just checking the feeds here, making sure things working okay. Um, it looks like it is. And for whatever reason, that top one, oh, I know what it is. We're going to actually get rid of this. There we go. And um, yeah, <laughs> uh, trying to, I, I just told my wife this morning, sometimes being the, the producer, the writer of the show, uh, the host of the show, uh, it, it does take a lot out of you. Um, not so much. I'm not, I mean, I'm not complaining at all about it, but trying to watch the stream behind me, I do want to change my desk back around. Like a, a lot of the, the veteran folks that's been here for a while have seen in the past um, because I normally would have the, the streaming computer over here on this side and I can actually uh, keep a better eye on what's going on. I can switch the cameras around better and stuff. So it just seems to work better for me. So today, I thought we would start off by talking about um, backing up your photographs. And I don't know if I told you or not recently, I had a major disaster here, and uh, it was it was a it was a real disaster. I mean, not well, not a real disaster. I guess it wasn't a fire. Thank God, it wasn't a uh, a hurricane blowing my house over or anything. But I had two backup drives i had a three terabyte drive and a two terabyte drive and even one of those drives on my mac you can do something called time machine i had time machine set up on one of those drives and it got a little warm or a little hot i could say one day it might have been right before we started putting the window air conditioners in in the windows and both of those drives fried at one time and they're unretrievable I'm talking family photos. I'm talking the kids' pictures from when they were smaller. And we lost all that stuff. And, you know, I can never really retrieve it. I've tried. I've tried everything I could do. You, A lot of you folks know that for a living, I am a computer technologist. So you think, well, Jack, you should be able to fix that pretty simply. I mean, that's what you do for a living. But that's not true. I mean, when they go, they go. And there's not a whole lot you can do. So what we're going to talk about is where you can store your photographs um, so you'll have those hopefully forever. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute because I just found out that that might not be the case. And other ways that you can store your photographs uh, to, to keep those memories alive. And basically, if you think about this, 
Uh, with today, the catchphrase in any technology realm out there, uh, the catchphrase is actually um, uh, cloud storage. So cloud storage is basically, and cloud was the phrase that was coined for this whole thing. And it's kind of funny because cloud storage is actually just that. It's, it's stored in the clouds, right? But you say that and people look up like, why? how would it be stored up in those clouds above my head? Well, the truth is it's stored on servers, on the internet. And the internet itself is formed in the, in the, in the shape, uh, whenever you do an internet, uh, a network drawing, in the shape of a cloud because it's all around us. And I guess that's, they could have called it stored all around us or all around us storage, whatever. Whatever you call it. The idea is, is this, folks is your photographs are not stored in your house. Uh, that is a horrible place to keep your photographs. If you have, and I've done videos on YouTube, you can look back at those. And if you have a, um, if you have boxes and boxes of old photographs, look for my YouTube video on scanning and restoring or just scanning old photos. You want to scan those to make those digital format. And the reason is, one, if you have them in your basement, you have some kind of a flood. And one lady called me one time or emailed me and said, uh, you know, Jack, how do I recover all this stuff? Um, she goes, I would have never thought I would have had a flood because we live up on top of a hill and, and I never thought the water would get me there. But her hot water tank broke, um, flooded the basement before they got home. And she came home to find her boxes of photographs floating in the water. She said, how can you restore those? Uh, so she restored some of them, uh, you know, rest I guess restored, scanned them in, got rid of some of the watermarks, but it, it was really, really a, a long process for her to do that. Or if you come home, once again, we hope this never happens to anybody. I, I was a fireman for years and I seen a lot of devastating fires. You come home and your whole house is burnt down. I mean, those pictures of, you know, a, a long lost grandparent, a long lost parent, um, that, you know, you can never recover anymore are gone. When they're burned up in a fire, there's no recovering those photographs. So there's two reasons. I mean, you may live in like Tornado Alley, uh, which is a bad, you know, place to live. And, and, you know, I hope that everybody that lives there stays very safe. But on the other hand, your pictures can be just totally blown away by a tornado, sucked up in a tornado, and who knows where they'll ever be. So these are things that we have to think about. These are things that, you know, I worry about with my photographs. So you scan those and turn those into digital format. Now, even if you keep them in your house, you're like, oh, Jack, they're on my computer. I got a four terabyte hard drive in my computer. Uh, the new Mac here has a three terabyte drive. Very nice drive. Can it fail? Absolutely, it can fail. So we should never have one point of storage for any of our photographs because let's face it folks they're digital now right years ago i know people used to take a lot of their family photos and store them in a safety deposit box and the same idea applied they were no longer in their residence they were somewhere else and if if a bank burns down ordinarily the vault uh, would not burn so that was a pretty safe place not a bad idea you could do the same thing i, I used to do that years ago i would burn things onto dvds um, again, it's called the 99-year media, but most of us probably won't be around to enjoy those pictures in 99 years. Or maybe. Maybe you'll live to be 110. But you take those photographs, and you would take them, burn them onto DVDs, and we would take them and put them in a safety deposit box. So that's that's another thing you could think about. And I'm just trying to look back here also at the uh, chat room just to see just to see if anybody's in the chat room there. So I know we had a lot of people on Facebook talking about the, the show this morning. So I'm sure you're here watching now and, and I do appreciate you being here. So today we don't have to take our photographs anymore to the bank. We don't have to pay uh, for a safety deposit box. You don't have to worry about any of that. And the reason is, is because there's really, really great sites out there that will protect our photos. And I'm going to talk about uh, five is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to give you one really, really downside I found out the other day. And if you read the terms and agreements, I'm sure you'll see it in there. And did I ever read the terms and agreements? Um, absolutely not. I, I never did. Um, and a lot of women will tell you that's like a man. You know, men usually don't read instructions. So 
Why would we read the terms and agreements of something before we sign up for it? We just sign up for it. And I'll tell you something I caught in there the other day, though, uh, that was brought to my attention that really threw me for a loop. So we're going to go and look at these uh, different uh, areas of storage. And I'm going to tell you a couple little tricks with these are, that are pretty good. So let's go ahead and flip over to the computer here and have a look at these. Let me first bring these up here. You don't need to show see my show notes. That would be silly. All right. Uh, let's see. Pull this down here. Oops. All right. So here we go. Let's start talking about some of these um, and how they are set up and how they work. <clears throat> now, this first one here is Flickr. Now, unfortunately, well, Flickr, let's go back. Flickr, F-L-I-C-K-R. A lot of you know I've used Flickr for a long time. If you can see my account on the screen, I joined in 2005. That's when Flickr was at its infancy. Infancy? Infancy. Um, it was just a very nice site, very young, and I was taking digital photographs. I said, look, I need a place to store these and maybe share these with other folks. Now, at that time, to share these, you had to be, uh, you had to have an account on Flickr and you can store them with, you can share them socially with other people on Flickr back and forth. But this is a site that I have paid for. I mean, now you can sign up for a free, I believe you get one terabyte of free storage. But if you sign up for a pro account, and it's not a lot of money, I think it's 25 bucks a year still, they give you unlimited photo storage. So unlimited photo storage, you think, well, that would be wonderful. That, that would save me. And we always do things after we have a, a disaster. And what, what I did after my disaster was the... Um, the hard drives crashed, and I, started, I told my wife, I said, oh. She goes, well, where's all your photos? They're on your computer. So even if the hard drive crashed, they're on your computer. And I said, no, I was using the hard drives as my, my, my photo catalogs. So all my Lightroom catalogs was on the hard drives. All my pictures when I imported them went straight to the hard drive. There was nothing on the local computer. She said, well, that was pretty dumb, and I agreed. That was a pretty dumb way to do it. The idea of a backup hard drive is to keep it on your hard drive on your computer because one or the other one of those should always be good. If one goes, you have the other one. But when I was relying everything on that hard drive, it, it bit me in the backside. So after that happened, I started looking around a little bit and I started thinking about, well, um, how can I automatically upload my stuff to Flickr when it gets on a computer? Is there a way to do that? And there is. Flickr has a very nice little program you put in your computer. It's called the Flickr Uploader. And in the earlier times, back in 2005, 2006, you had to open it up, put your photos in there, and it would upload them to Flickr. But now they've automated that. So whenever I put photographs now onto my hard drive on my computer, those files are actually automatically seen by the uploader, and it just sends them up to Flickr. I don't have to worry about those. Here's also something very important about a storage site for your foot, uh, for your photos is make sure when it uploads that it marks those as private. And the reason I say this is if you're shooting a wedding, birthday party, uh, I know my, uh, my friend here on here that watches all the shows, Fabian, does a lot of modeling shots, uh, senior shots, senior portraits. If you do that, you don't want those photos to go up in the unedited state uh, and be out there for anybody to find them. So this way it marks them private until, you know, you can do your edits and do whatever. And you can always go and re, you know, it'll re-upload those edited photos and then make those either uh, public so people can see those or not. So that is one thing we can send them to is Flickr. The automatic uploader, like I say again, is great. They have an app for your iPhone or your Android phone. So as you're snapping pictures, they are sending those to Flickr. So Flickr becomes that, that, that global place for all of your photographs. All your photos get uploaded, and you can go there and visit and see them whenever you wish. Um, you can see in my album here, we have a bunch of stuff from even from last Christmas. Uh, yep, there's me with a big old noodle maker. Didn't work out too well for us here, but 
my son with a pair of boxers. So these are from last year. What else is nice about it is you can set up albums. So if you go in your albums, we can have albums in here. And I'm just looking through here for some kind of album that we would want to see. Uh, iPhoto events. You can see I got some scanned pictures in there. So there's, there's a lot of neat things you can do with this and send this, um, you know, just works out really, really well. Here's the downside for us, the semi-amateur pro photographers out there, is Flickr does not allow us to upload raw images. Right there, that's, that's, that's a catch. That's a red flag. Whoop, no raw images. I tried to upload them privately. Nope, we can't accept raw images. And they're working on it, but I don't know if the raw images are actually the reason they can't take that is because the um, uh, they can't figure out a way for you to view them back. But they should at least allow you to upload those so they have them or so you have somewhere to store your photos. If you're looking for a one-stop photo storage uh, photo place, this would be it. And you could upload raw images. So if you're shooting raw, with which a lot of us do, uh, you can't send those up. So that is the downside. And... That's one thing. Second thing, my wife told me the other day, she said, did you see that Yahoo was going under? Yahoo is like, you know, they may file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy or Chapter 7 or whatever businesses file. Um, they can't keep up with the other services out there. They're losing money left and right. They're laying off people. Well, Flickr is owned by Yahoo. Yahoo is the parent company of Flickr. So <laughs> if they go under... We're going to lose all of our photographs. And here's another thing I found the other day with all of these sites that I'm mentioning today. In their terms of service, it states that the service may disappear and all of your photographs may actually be lost at any given time with no prior warning. It's in the agreement. If you go through the agreement, you'll find that. They're not going to say, hey, look, download all your stuff today because we can't support this. Nope. Uh, if one of these businesses go out of business, they will go in, they will flip the old switch, shut the power off, and off you go. So, I mean, you, you're not going to be able to access it no more. That's what happened. If you folks remember, some years ago, I used to do this show on, on a network called Justin.tv, right? Justin TV. One day I went to uh, produce a show. I, I was bringing up Justin TV to put my information in. It was no longer there. It was gone. Now, of course, most of us used it as a free service. And it was just simply gone. So that happens with internet companies every day of the week. So it's something to think about. So you say, Jack, if that's the case, then why should I use Flickr? Well, pick two of these sites. Put them in two different cloud storages. If one business goes out of business, you still have your pictures somewhere else. Just a thought. You can still have a backup hard drive at home. That's probably a good idea also. Um, I always store mine on a backup drive at home and send them out. Uh, the new drive I purchased here is a Western Digital MyCloud uh, storage device. It has uh, four terabytes of hard drive space, and it allows me to access that thing on my phone, uh, on a laptop, on an iPad, anywhere I am uh, in the world. I can access that hard drive and uh, upload files. So it's kind of like my own private uh, Dropbox, if you will. Dropbox. Funny I said that because that's the next thing we're going to look at here. And here's some Dropbox. Here's some photographs that I have in Dropbox. Uh, actually, if I can move my mouse around here. So I have some photographs in Dropbox. And, uh, you know, you can see them under Photos. It's very nice. I believe you can upload raw images to Dropbox. I don't know if you'd be able to view the raw images in Dropbox. But you can upload raw images. Now, the downside of Dropbox is... I believe you get one, uh, you might not even get a terabyte. You might get 500 megabytes for free when you sign up. It used to be 250. Here's a trick though. Once you sign up for it and you understand Dropbox and how it works, send invites to other folks via email. And if you send invites via email, what's going to happen is you can actually uh, build every time somebody signs up with them, even for a free account, you get 250 more megabytes uh, of storage space. So that's something to think about. And it's, it's a nice way. I think I'm up to about a, a one gigabytes of storage 
uh, just by sending out invites to folks. So Dropbox, though, if you don't have the invites and if you do need a lot of space, it gets very, very expensive very quickly. Dropbox is probably one of the most expensive services out there that you can buy. I mean, you know, who wants to spend, uh, you know, even $20 a month for storage? I mean, granted, these are your photographs. It is an insurance policy, so 20 bucks a month is 20 bucks a month. Something to think about. Uh, I can't really say anything bad about Dropbox. It's It's been very well. It's worked. I've used it for years now, and they're always building new features into this, like the timeline here, the new feature. Uh, they do have albums. I don't think I have any albums created, nothing created yet. Uh, you go back to photos, and you can see all the photographs there. So it is a very nice site. It works well. It's something you might want to look into. So the next one we're going to talk about is, again, there's so many of these. The catchphrase is the cloud. So everybody's building cloud services. I can't say Dropbox is probably one of the pioneers in this field, one of the first people to actually start um, building an online storage service such as this. And they've done a really remarkable job. And they're always, they're always innovating. So it's something to look into. It also works on your smartphones, your tablets, and whatever else. So there you have that. The next one is from those great creators of Windows, Microsoft. So Microsoft calls theirs OneDrive. Now, OneDrive is very nice. Uh, again, you can upload stuff. It shows your photos. It will pull your photos and show you your photographs uh, in a timeline once again. So there's a nice timeline there. And you can see your photographs very well. I believe when you sign up for OneDrive, uh, when you first sign up for it, they were going to do unlimited storage, but then people started really abusing it. And why people abuse stuff, I have no idea. But people started abusing it, and what they came up with now is they give everybody one terabyte of storage. One terabyte in today's world doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot of storage for your photographs. So... And they do, I believe they do allow you to upload raw images. So, and I haven't really played with uploading them yet. <clears throat> OneDrive also has, as well as Dropbox, they have applications for your computer. So when you go into either my computer or when you go into Finder on your Mac, you will see a, a Dropbox uh, or, or on your listing, you know, you'll see your like hard drive, you'll see Dropbox, you'll see OneDrive or whatever, which one of these you pick. So it, again, is a nice way to put your photos up there. It's easy to share them with family and friends. And it's just a great place to store your photographs. And it's not, even if you want to upgrade upgrade your storage, OneDrive is one of those ones that's a little bit less expensive than some of the other competitors out there. Because let's face it, what's happening is Microsoft is trying to take business away from Dropbox. That's just, that's their mission, is to take business away from Dropbox and this next company. The next company we're going to talk about is good old Google Drive. Google Drive is Google's idea of being able to provide storage space for your photographs. Also, I wanted to point out that Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive all have automatic uploaders for your phone, for your iPhone, and for your Android phone. So if you're out there, and I, I mention phones a lot because we do use the cameras in those phones a lot, granted. Because, you know, this bad boy here that we're going to talk about in a little bit, this bad boy here, you know, a 35 millimeter DSLR uh, with a 24 by uh, 70 lens. You know, well, this happens to be my 17 by 35 wide angle lens. It's a lot of weight. Uh, it's easier for me to pull my phone out of my pocket, snap a picture, than to carry this bad boy around. So it's something to think about. But that's why I mention phones a lot, because it's nice to have those automatically uploaded. And when you do this, I'm going to give you a little trick. Make sure you go into the application settings and turn on what says Wi-Fi only. The reason you want to do that is if you're out taking pictures somewhere and your pictures are getting uploaded with your data plan on your phone, sooner or later that data plan, you're going to be paying a lot of money. You don't want to end up paying $200 extra uh, overages because you are accidentally uploading photos somewhere. No, let them store them on the phone. When you come back home, let them upload on your wireless internet, your Wi-Fi. So that is uh, Google Drive. And Google Drive is, is another great place to, to store your photographs. 
This new one may not be new to you, but it was definitely new to me. I signed up for something called Amazon Prime. Now, Amazon Prime, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it out there, is you pay $99 a year and you get free two-day shipping. Well, what people are missing, and when I tell people about some of these other products, they're like, what? Are you talking? Really? For my night? I get that? <laughs> I stumbled upon this the other day, just looking at the Prime account and seeing what was in there, you know, what was going on with it. And so I found that you could now get Amazon Cloud Drive. Now, Amazon Cloud Drive, they allow you to upload as many photographs, unlimited folks. There's no limit on bandwidth. There's no limit on the amount of storage that's in there. You can upload all of your photographs to this Amazon Cloud Drive for absolutely free with your Prime membership. So now, you know, do you really need to pay Dropbox? Do you really need to pay uh, OneDrive? Uh, buy extra Google Drive storage, pay for that Flickr account. When you're already paying for Amazon Prime, and the cool thing about it is it's with your Amazon Prime account. So I set it up immediately. I came up, I started playing around with this. I said, look, I'm going to set this up, start uploading my pictures to it, and uh, see, what come, see what turns out. And it's pretty amazing. I mean, it works well. The pictures look nice in there. Uh, they upload really, really quickly. And also, you can upload raw images. Now, Amazon Drive, Am Amazon Cloud Drive, I cannot at this time find an automatic backup feature that will automatically send the photos there like Flickr, but I'm sure they're working on it because everybody wants your business in this realm. Now, if you want to upload videos, I believe with the Prime account, you get, I think it was 500 megabytes or one gigabyte. It wasn't much space to upload your videos. If you go over that, then you have to pay extra. So that's just something to think about. If you go over, you got to pay extra for it. You have to sign up for the um, the the Cloud Drive Premium Edition. And uh, you can sign up for that. Pay the extra, I think it was an extra, I believe $39 a year. And then you have unlimited video and file storage. So you can upload your files, whatever videos that you want to upload to those. So it also has the app for your uh, iPhone and your Android phone something to think about and you can uh, simply store your photos there so i just gave you five different possibilities of places to store your photos outside of your house i would recommend if you do this remember store them on your hard drive have a, a local backup drive at your house uh, you know like a western digital drive or a my cloud drive or whatever you have a usb drive plugged into your computer and back those photos up regularly and then send them out and have them or have them automatically sent out to one of these online storage sites. So that's a couple different ideas for you. And I'm just looking here to see, as I always do, keeping up with the chat room. Okay, so that looks good. Oops. Go back down here a little bit. All right. So anyway, that is my online uh, photo storage part of the show for you today. And um, just a few things I, I wanted to give you. I took some uh, show notes here. Remember again, Flickr has no raw images. Dropbox becomes very costly. OneDrive is good for smaller JPEG images. Google Drive works well with Google+. Plus. Because, you know, Google Plus is kind of the place where you can have your photos come up. And also, don't forget uh, Picasso. We talked about Picasso some years ago. Google still owns that. They're still developing for it. So it's also nice. When you put pictures there, they go to your Google Drive. So it's something to think about. Um, and then Amazon Cloud Drive is free with the Prime. Unlimited photo uploading and also including your raw images can be uploaded there. So that is a couple um, pretty cool things to think about. So this part of the show, we are going to now talk about, just briefly, I better tell you about our sponsors. Folks, we've had sponsors sponsoring the show since years ago when I started it. Um, I have, I've actually uh, got been in contact with these folks, and um, you know they still sponsor the show. And those folks are 
uh, green screen wizard with Ken. If you need any green screening products, go to my website though, go to the photography guy.net and click on the little green screen icon. That way they know they're coming from, you're coming from the show and they make sure that they give the show back the credit for sending you there. So it's, it's a great, great green screening software. So check out green screen wizard. Smugmug.com. Don't forget Smugmug. If you want to sell your photos or be even a halfway amateur, uh, your amateur, uh, I always call it um, amateur pro because I'm, I never consider myself to be a professional photographer. Um, I always consider myself to be an amateur pro photographer where I've made money on my, on my photography, uh, but I don't do it every day for a living. So to me, that's like an amateur pro and better or pro amateur, if, if you will. But uh, Smug Mug is great because you can upload your photos there, set your own pricing, and uh, send a, a link to your clients. They click on that link, they purchase their photographs, and uh, and then you get you know you actually get a check back, a commission check for the photos that you sold on there. So it's a really great site, and easy to use. Another one is Portrait Professional. If you take a lot of portraits and you want to do touch ups and you don't want to have to go through all the tools and elements or Lightroom to do your touch-ups, Portrait Professional will save you hours and hours of time. Uh, I use it. Be careful with it, though. It can make somebody look very porcelain. Um, but so if you want to do light makeup touches and stuff and just light corrections on somebody's uh, face for a portrait, Portrait Professional is the way to go. And don't forget about my own site. Again, jtclearning.com, jtclearning.com. Um, I definitely sponsor my own show, that's for sure. But that site and you coming there and learning, uh, taking those courses, keeps these free shows going. It helps me to uh, purchase equipment I need, uh, such as the new iMac you see behind me here. I mean, you have to buy new equipment. I have to keep up to date uh, to produce these shows to make sure we have enough uh, you know, speed on the computers to actually turn the shows out, as well as paying for the internet uh, that I have here. You know, the internet bandwidth has to be paid for. So check those out at jtclearning.com. A few of you are still going to jackstechcorn.com, and I appreciate you going over there, and you've been donating to the show. That's just another great way you can help us out here. So check that out at jackstechcorner.com. Click on the Donate button, and I truly appreciate it. And again, it really, really helps the shows out. Okay, let's get into the second segment here this morning. Uh, we don't want to keep you here all day on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. I know it's a really nice 32 degrees out there. I can't wait to get out and mow the grass, maybe go out and play some tennis, maybe hit around a golf. Okay, probably not. I'll probably sit here instead and work on some, uh, some more courses because you know I'm doing the Elements 14 course. But I had a person the other day actually uh, email me back and forth. We talked back and forth. I, forgive me, I forget your name, of course. But we talked about um, her buying a new camera. It has a lot of settings on it. She's not sure what to do with them. So she's been throwing the camera in automatic and just shooting in auto because all the other settings, the pictures look horrible. and She doesn't quite understand what she's doing wrong. So what I thought I would talk to you a little bit about today is shooting modes and how we can change them to capture what you want to capture. And I thought I was going to have some I was actually working on some ideas with some uh, some samples, but maybe I'll be able to get those. Uh, maybe for next week, we'll talk about some sample shooting. But anyway, I have my handy dandy. Whoops, found dropper on the floor. I have my handy dandy Nikon D600 camera here. Now the D600, if you're not familiar with it, it is a full frame camera. <clears throat> and I'm going to get a thousand emails when I tell you this, but this is a little observation I've made since owning a full frame camera. If you have a DX camera or a cropped frame for the better uh, terminology of it, um, or if you're looking to buy a camera and you're stuck between a DX and an FX, a cropped frame or a full frame camera, I would save the extra thousand dollars off the full frame camera and I would just simply buy the cropped camera. The truth is they take very, very nice photographs. I've used them in countless weddings, countless senior shoots, and they work absolutely fine. I bought this because I was under the assumption that if I had a full frame camera, that I would probably take better photographs, that I would probably capture something I wasn't capturing before. Uh, but the truth is we shot a wedding once. I believe it was with a D7000, which is a crop frame, uh, crop frame icon. 
and a D600. The photos across the board was pretty much the same, uh, the same quality. Uh, they look nice. I mean, so anyway, that's the first part. So I just wanted to say, because this is a D600, it's a full frame, but that's the reason I have it is because I thought it would be that much better, but I probably blew a thousand bucks. I didn't need the bl uh, blow on it. So, and don't ever tell my wife if you meet her because I'll deny I ever said it. Then she'll go back and watch this video and then she'll crown me anyway. But, but that's life. That's what we do, right? We buy something because we think it's that much better that we need it and we get it and we're like, eh, it really wasn't that much better. And we'll talk about that in future shows about some lighting and stuff because I've purchased strobes like plug-in strobes that, you know, really the, the speed lights have done just as well. So, but we'll talk about that in some future shows. But what I wanted to talk about today was the shooting modes because you should never buy a DSLR camera or now a lot of you are buying the mirrorless cameras, which I understand from Jake out there, my friend in uh, Cincinnati, that the mirrorless cameras are great. He loves it. He says it's lightweight. I think he bought the, he bought a Sony A1, I think uh, Jake told me. He says he loves it. Um, but I have not been out to spend the extra money to buy another camera in a long time. I've had this D6, I believe the D610 or the D620 is out now for Nikon line. I'm not even sure. But uh, this camera still does everything I need to do. Uh, it's great. When I bought it, they were having trouble with some kind of dirt sensors or bad chips or I don't know what the heck they were having. But I sent it back. Nikon put a whole brand new uh, shutter mechanism in there, put a whole new sensor in there for me and everything for free. And uh, it's just been a workhorse. Great little camera. But we wanted to talk about settings. Now, on this camera and on your camera, you can look. And Canon's a little bit different than Nikon. We have fully automatic settings. The only time your camera should ever be on fully automatic setting is if you're going to hand this camera, like you're out with your wife and kids or your husband and kids and, and you're somewhere and you want to get a group picture. You don't want to use those fantastic editing techniques that I taught you on one of the YouTube videos. You want to just have all your family captured and we've done it. We've been out a lot of places and we want all of us captured. I turn my camera on automatic and I hand it to the person, uh, say, hey, uh, excuse me, can you take a photograph of us? And I hand them the, the camera. I say, here, here's my camera. Here, just, it, people get freaked out with, with 35 millimeters anyway because they have shutter focus. They, they're pushing it. Oh, oh, it's not clicking right. No, because you have to hold it halfway, beep, beep, get a focus, and then push it the, the, the following way to, to let the shutter go. And they just want to slam that button down. It doesn't work that way. So I put it in automatic mode because I don't need them doing anything. And I tell them, do not touch the dial. Don't turn, don't zoom, don't leave it alone, right? Anyway, so that's what automatic mode is for. Automatic mode is not for the owner of the camera. What? Yes, automatic mode is not for the owner of the camera. I'll say it again. If you own a DSLR and you're going to automatic, throw it away and go buy yourself a point and shoot. Maybe I better wrap this from our, throw the camera away, go buy yourself a point and shoot or use your phone to take your photographs. This is too much for you, and you probably don't need one. With that said, that's why you're watching these, these videos, and you're going out there on YouTube saying, who can help me with this thing? I want to learn. Great. Let's go to P mode. P mode to me is called play mode. No, it's not, Jack. It's called program mode. But I call it play mode because the only thing that P mode does is that automatic does not do, to be honest with you. It perfectly makes sense. P mode does not activate the auto flash. I don't know if it's dark enough in here. That's automatic, right? If I push the shutter, the flash pops up because it knows it probably needs flash in here. If I put it on P mode and I hit the shutter, I could take a photograph and you see the flash does not come up. So P mode doesn't do any more. I call it the programmed automatic mode. The only thing it does is does not pop up my automatic flash. Not a big deal. It just doesn't do that. If you have... Another good warning for you. If you have a flash on your hot shoe on the top, and we've talked about uh, external flashes or off-camera flashes, and you have it on automatic mode, and this happens, that's not going to be good for your camera. You can crack this and something can break up here on the top of your camera. You don't want that to pop up when you have a hot shoe flash up here on top of your camera. So be careful. If you put a flash on, at the very least, put it on program mode or P mode. 
because it's going to keep that down and you can use your external flash. Okay. The next mode is shutter priority mode. So what does shutter priority mode do? Well, obviously it's the speed of the shutter opening and closing. Okay. Opening, closing, firing, closing, whatever. We can adjust it very, very slow. And I had somebody email me a couple weeks ago. says, Jack, well, the new Elements 14, will that help me get rid of my shaky pictures? And I started thinking, I said, shaky pictures? And, and she emailed me back. I said, yeah, my, my camera shakes a lot when I'm taking pictures. Now, that is not the case. This does not happen. It, it, you could do that and make some pretty creative photographs, but that does not happen. You, you don't, you're not, no. If it does, buy a tripod and stick it on here because there might be an earthquake. Well, if there's an earthquake, it could be, but you, you should never, there's no reason. What happens, though, is in a camera, if we get the shutter speed too slow, and this is what happens. If it's low light, you're getting, and it's staying open so long, and then closing. You're not doing this. The camera is struggling to get focus if there's any movement at all in that photograph. If you're taking a landscape picture and a wind blows, a tree, it will look like the camera was shaking to beat all but. But it was not. And what it was, the shutter was staying open too long, trying to capture light is what it's doing. And the camera itself inside the mechanism is not focusing properly and can't capture that photograph. So shutter priority allows us to do things like uh, have a faster shutter speed, you know, where it's really fast shutter speed. So be careful with low light. If you're in low light, I'm getting this in a minute. We're going to talk about ISO, ISO. You have to understand both. You can't understand only one. But if you're in low light, you're using shutter priority, you want to get some slower shutter speeds for whatever reason, buy yourself a flash or open your flash on your camera, whatever. Give yourself that added boost of light. What also shutter priority mode allows us to do, and if you've ever seen any of Kevin Rice's work, I suggest that you check those out. Check out his work. What you'll find out is he can capture water and make it look like it's moving glass. He is the best person I've ever seen do this, and my hat's off to him. I've tried a hundred times. I've emailed him and said, Kevin, what am I doing wrong? And he said, it's your shutter, your shutter mode. You know, you got to get a slow shutter speed. You got to get a good tripod. You get that camera down in towards the water, and you take that picture, and you'll get that water moving. But it's, it's slow because it's open long enough. The water's overlaying itself. If you have a fast shutter speed, you're just going to get the bubbles and the stuff blowing over. It, different effect. So that's what shutter speed will do for us. Aperture priority mode. Now, also remember, when we use shutter priority mode, we're setting the shutter speed. The aperture gets set for us. The cameras are very smart creatures. We pay a lot of money for these cameras. We have to allow them to do some of the work because that's what we pay for. The next one is aperture priority mode. Aperture priority mode allows us to set the aperture and then the camera will figure out the shutter speed for us. Because remember, we can have a, a closed down aperture, right? Very small aperture or you get a very wide open aperture. And that is how much the aperture inside the camera is open to allow light into the, to filter into the camera. And then the shutter speed, shutter speed will be set accordingly to whatever aperture you're shooting at. Another problem people get a lot of times, and I told this lady this too, that one with the shaking camera, is if you're using a kit lens, and folks, I've used kit lens to shoot weddings. Uh, they are very, very capable lenses. Uh, you do want to buy more expensive lenses as you go down the road, and they're more expensive not because they got a wider opening, not because they are heavy duty, not none of that. They're more expensive simply because of the fact that the aperture is able, it has the ability to open wider up, okay? So you can get a, a better aperture, say like a 1.8, a 2.8. What that does is allows more light into the lens, and you can take pictures at lower light settings without having to use a flash. So that's why they do cost more. You know, you buy those 24 by 70s. Um, I have another one that's a uh, 70 by 200. Those are expensive lenses. I'm looking at one now, and, I, and really I'm not too much worried about, you know, the aperture of, of the lens, but I'm looking for a fisheye lens. So if anybody has a recommendation, uh, I love shooting wide. That's why the wide angle lens is on this camera now. 
Okay, so the last one we're going to talk about is manual mode. Now, manual mode, you are setting your aperture and your shutter speed at the exact same time. You have to know both of those. And I've done a lot of videos in the past. We've talked about using a light meter, which I truly love. It gives me a, the idea of what I need to set those at, at least a base reading. You can also do it through your camera, folks. You can be out there and you can snap a picture. You can make some adjustments, snap another picture, do some chimping. Chimping, remember chimping? Look at the screen, shoot another picture. Okay, I got a good setting now. I, I know where I got to be. So that is uh, the manual mode. But I would surely suggest, don't let anybody tell you you're not really a photographer unless you're shooting in manual mode. You got to shoot manual mode to be a photographer. Yeah, that's not really true. Um, to be a photographer, you have to take great photos. You have to take really, really nice photographs um, to be a photographer, right? We don't need to shoot in manual mode. I will say manual mode is... I think I'd be lying if I told you that too. Manual mode is one of those modes that um, I, they should almost call it the C mode, the creative mode. But not that you can't create great photographs in aperture priority, shutter priority. Program mode, you are not, forget that. Uh, in automatic mode, you are not going to create uh, works of art. You, you just not forget that too. So it's not going to happen. But, um, you know, but the biggest thing I can say with your camera, with these modes, with these settings, practice makes perfect. You, you know, I shoot, I've been shooting a lot more anymore. I've found when I do take the camera out, I've been shooting more in aperture priority mode um, because I want to know that depth of field. I want to know what I'm looking at. I want to know if I'm blowing the background out. The shutter speed and stuff, the camera can deal with that on its own because that's why I paid the money for the cameras. That's why you paid the money. It, it'll figure that out for you. Do I shoot on manual modes? I do if I'm doing a portrait shoot. Uh, and the other reason is, is because I'm using a light meter normally for my uh, for my lights or for my strobes or for my uh, speed lights, whatever I'm using. And I do like the 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 manual mode for that because I'm you know I'm adjusting the lighting based on the uh, the shutter and the aperture. So it's kind of what's going on there. I'll look back here for a second and see what's going on. If anything. Uh, let's see here. All right. Okay, folks. So that is about all I have for you here. We are going to uh, come back here for just a second and finish this out. Uh, let's see here. If I could possibly find this real quick. Since I didn't have it open before, we are going to uh, look for this real quick here. And I hate turning away from you here. But we are going to, as soon as I find it, if I find it, yeah, I'm not seeing it. Um, let's pull this out here. And we'll just bring us down here. Just like so. All right, folks. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Uh, spread the word out there. You know, tell them that we are creating great photographs. And uh, don't forget to check out my website at jtclearning.com. Check that out. I'd love you to go over there, and I would definitely uh, love for you to, uh, you know, sign up for one of the courses. And uh, you can't go wrong. So take care, everybody. Have a great work week. And until next week. Keep those shutters clicking. Keep your editors editing. And remember, Christmas is coming. Or whichever holiday you celebrate this time of year, you're going to have those cameras out, make some great memories, and store those online. All right, everybody. I'll talk to you next week here on The Photography Guy. Bye-bye for now, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to The Photography Guy. I am a photography guy, and I'll be here once again next time for more photography tips and tricks. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe to the show and enjoy the music.